So welcome to Massey College. Uh, my name is Nathalie de Rosier and I'm the principal of Massey College. It's my great privilege and pleasure to welcome you here for a very, very special day. I first want to acknowledge that Massey College is built on indigenous lands, the lands of the Onoshawnee, the Huron Wandak, and it is this treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. All of us want to acknowledge uh, our duty of stewardship toward this land and also the great privilege that we have to continue to do our work here. Massey College lost a very special member of its community, Ivan McFarlane. And uh, I think we all hear uh, partly because of him. But it precipitated, I think, uh, an initiative from the junior fellow to want to honor him. At the same time, I want to uh, really thank uh, the chair of the art committee, <laughs> uh, John Massey, for taking on a broader project that would you know, reimagine a little bit the upper library and making a place of inclusivity. And so I think uh, it's the inspiration that we had from Ivan, who loved books, wanted to be here all the time to, uh, for the book club and so on. And we'll have an occasion to remember him throughout uh, today. So without further ado, I just want to thank again. Um, Julian Posada was the Don of Hall uh, in 2019-2020. And he's the one that you know, began this process when he came to me and says, we need to have a portrait of Ivan uh, somewhere, and uh, let's do it. We really want that, and the junior fellowship was behind this. Uh, Julian is at Yale. He's now secured a permanent job at Yale, so we were really happy for him, and he sends his regards just wanting to celebrate this day as we all gather here today. So I just want to thank also uh, the curator of this fabulous exhibit. I hope that you got the little next chapter, uh, and Sarah uh, Rubayo Sheridan. And I just want to pass the mic to uh, uh, John Massey. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Uh, it uh, has been a bit of a circuitous process to get uh, an art committee A, then to actually grow a vine that produced grapes that we're now looking at. Uh, this is a wonderful moment for me because it's taken actually years. Um, Massey College is connected to me because uh, my family was instrumental in um, actually establishing the college. Uh, and they were very, very involved. Uh, all of uh, my ancestors were involved with creating a larger community. Um, they wanted for Massey a community of scholars that would uh, reside with one another, and uh, there would thereby be an exchange of ideas, um, and they would uh, be in a place where they would be cohabiting, and this would give a, another level to uh, discussion, which it does. This is a little bit of an extension of that. Um, we are in a new era now, epochally. Uh, we have to take stock. And this is just a small, um, a small embrace of, of that in the world of books uh, and material that has been gathered very, very carefully uh, to create these collages, the portrait, uh, and to begin a process of renewal, really. So, um, this is all that I have to say. I'm very happy that you will all come. Uh, and we are now going to hear what uh, the artists and uh, my wonderful curator is going to say. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for coming today. I have to say I'm still um, really thrilled to be in rooms with people again. <laughs> Um, and so this is a very joyous occasion. Um, as John mentioned, it was a project that got to take its time to come into form. Um, and I think that it really gained in the process of the slowing down and the stretching of time that happened to us in this period. Um, so as I said, assembling in this room to me is very exciting. Um, why is it exciting? This is a space of knowledge and reading. 
Um, these are precepts very at the heart of the college as well. So as um, Natalie so nicely signaled, um, Ivan McFarlane was an avid advocate for books. Um, so this project really embraces the idea that books represent spheres of knowledge. So how did I come into this picture? So when John approached me about um, doing contemporary projects at the college, we knew that this would be one of the sites that is most trafficked, is most public facing at the college. Um, and it had a use value because these are books that have accrued over time. They're a little bit of a reflection of the people who've passed through this space. Um, and I had the feeling that it needed to expand the spheres of knowledge that were represented here. And there was space to kind of infiltrate, revive, work through this space in order to, to bring it into a contemporary feeling envelope. Um, so there's a lot, I hope, in this project that is about carrying over the values and the intents of the artists who are invited into the project. Um, and I don't want to take too much time because I think what's great about an artist is speak about their practice and their work. It's also an opportunity for, um, for us to look at some overlaps and points of interest amongst both of you. Um, so I will say that uh, this is Erin Jones, who is responsible for the collages that we see on the walls here uh, under the beautiful title, Seeing Knowledge. Um, and then we have Gordon Shadrach, who painted, uh, was commissioned to paint the likeness of Ivan McFarland that hangs now and greets everyone as they come into this space. Um, and I understand there's also family members who are maybe seeing this portrait for the first time, so it's, it's really a, a beautiful occasion to, to celebrate the finishing up of and bringing and gathering together all of these elements. Um, and a um, third collaborator not sitting up here right now that I want to signal is a different book list. Um, they were so integral in all of the other work they've done over decades to create a cultural hub and to carry the books that we um, have assembled. So I'll just quickly note to the relationship between the books and the projects. So the books that you see in the limited vitrines, um, those, the artwork on those covers were the source material um, that Aaron was looking at when he was making the collages that hang on the walls. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit more as we're conversing with Aaron. Um, and then the other titles, I was inspired by um, many librarians across the country, many university librarians and others. Um, who were doing the work under the call of Black Lives Matter and the urgency um, to take action on anti-black racism. They were, there was a ton of circulating book lists and they were so exciting to read and to think about well, what would it mean to insert those titles and make them available as a real practical, usable knowledge source within the college. Um, so these books are meant to also be discussed in this room, taken for private study, for conversation. Hopefully they also germinate a set of ideas and conversations at the college. That's really integral to me as well on this project. So uh, first I want to start with Gordon and the portrait. Um, so we approached Gordon, um, you know, based, obviously you have an extensive practice in portraiture. Um, and we thought you would be a great um, artist to take on the charge of the likeness of this person. Um, so thank you for saying yes to that <laughs> invitation. My pleasure. <laughs> yeah. um, and I guess, you know, I think what might be interesting to people too is um, you often in your portraits would have occasion to study um, live subjects, to meet with the person whose mm -hmm. likeness you're creating. And in this particular um, example, you didn't have that available to you. Um, so just if you could talk about your, your process and, and researching and coming into and, and sort of um, the inspiration that got you closer to this person as you were rendering his likeness, how you built that proximity and, and what the representational stakes were for you personally also in, in saying yes to this <laughs> invitation. <laughs> Um, also, can I start off with the representational stakes first? Yeah, please. <laughs> uh, I think representation is so important, so that's my focus of my work. And um, this was a really great opportunity to participate in something that was actually um, 
uh, the word I'm going to use is healing. Um, so, you know, creating a, a bridge and building connections. And I think that's a really important step is when people are recognizing the changes that need to happen and the work that needs to be done. So I was very pleased to be asked to be part of this. And I really appreciated that because I think, um, you know, when those calls come, you should answer them or, or instead of just saying, back and say, well, I'm upset or things need to change. It's always great when you have the opportunity to actually be part of the change. Um, so that was a really important part for me. Um, the second part was, uh, yes, it is challenging to paint from photographs, but I mostly do paint from photographs. Um, however, what was particularly challenging for me for this was the fact that uh, by all uh, reports, he was quite a charming man <laughs> and uh, had quite a presence. And so um, I had a series of photographs that I worked with, and but what was really helpful to me the most was actually, I think, the meeting that we had online, um, where a few of us discussed and some of his family members were on that conversation. And um, it, that really helped me feel a connection to him. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting because, you know, I'm doing a portrait for academia, but at the same time, here's a person that seems to have quite a larger than life character from what I was hearing. It was hard to sort of marry those two elements to bring that joy that he had and that charm, but at the same time, recognize the space that it's going into. Um, the other challenge was, um, for me personally, was that, er so, he I'll be quite blunt, uh, every photo that I had of him, he was a different shade. <laughs> so, and so, and there's a whole issue around portraiture and black portraiture with shadism and what happens with acknowledging, you know, skin tone. And um, it was a bit challenging to get the right tone. And I still don't really know if I did because of the fact that the lighting is different in every photograph. So I really struggled with that because it was something that I thought was very important to capturing him properly. Um, and he was also different ages. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I mean, I'm letting it all out right now. But yeah, so there were some particular challenges that I had to sort of, sort of figure out how I wanted to sort of create this person that represented someone who was so important and had so much meaning, but be so respectful to what I wanted to do and also, you know, make him look good. Um, so it, it was a real process. It was a real challenge of painting and repainting. And even before we, I started painting, having done a couple of sketches uh, that I presented to you, it was an interesting thing because I'd also just come off another commission um, where um, I was asked to create something, but it, it was intentionally meant to have all these sort of Easter eggs that related to the person. Mm -hmm. And so I was really in this mindset of making sure I included all these little aspects that I'd been told about him in the portrait. And I think in that first stage, it was kind of losing who he was. It wasn't really centered on him. And so in our discussions, it came back to really focusing on him and then acknowledging certain aspects of who he is and who he was in, in a subtler way. Um, so it was a very challenging process. It was, it was a little unusual in the sense that I felt there was higher stakes in this because it was a posthumous portrait. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it had more meaning uh, because this was a way of, of, you know, ensuring that someone lives on in a, in a visible, tangible way. And um, so I put a lot of pressure on myself <laughs> for this. And even today I was like, oh, I was a little anxious. But it, it's a very, I'm really glad that I had the opportunity and I'm really appreciative that I was asked to participate in this. And um, I really am grateful that I have the abilities that I do that has allowed me to have these experiences. I think, the, I know that I'm very fortunate to, to be in the position that I'm in, and this was just another excellent example of, of showing me how lucky I am. Hmm. If I, I'm remembering also from some conversations through the process, um, at one point you had also mentioned like his particular immigration trajectory too, and the mm. generation that he is, mm. um, that you felt like there was also you know, overlap also with your own yeah. like family heritage, time, place, like, I think that's also an interesting indexing of like um, uh, a set of historical constraints and a community yeah. here in Toronto too. If you want yeah, to. we talked a little bit about the dignity, uh, dignity politics, mm -hmm. and how um, 
there was a generational um, aspect of, of race and politics with regards to um, working for change through um, sort of more inherent sort of ways of, of presentation and education and how one moves through society, uh, which are key elements to change and acceptance. However, you know, over time you start to realize that it, part of that is aligning yourself with the people who are oppressing you, which is an issue. And secondly, it really didn't make change and it didn't affect change as quickly and as effectively as it should have. And so part of the change that has to happen has to make the people who are the oppressors uncomfortable. Um, and it isn't about trying to always make people feel good about you know, themselves. It's about really speaking up and doing the work that needs to be done. My parents you know, were the same generation, and they raised their four sons that way. So mm -hmm. it's, it's mostly as I've gotten older. And I'm not dismissing it. I mm -hmm. think it is a key element. And it was a very important time and a very important way to live your life because it also probably kept a lot of people alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so we can't ignore that factor. But we also can't ignore the fact that um, in some situations, um, race relations are worse now than they would have been 50 years ago. Um, and so people have to speak up and have to really, really fight for the changes that we want to see. Mm -hmm. But he also, you know, going back to those early discussions, a lot of what we talked about, he really reminded me of my, those conversations reminded me of my family, my upbringing, mm -hmm. and in particular reminded me of my dad, mm -hmm. um, who was quite a charmer and uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, very engaging man he was. Yeah, yeah and we talked about some of those, um, I think also even my own family, I, I, maybe it's a common immigrant experience too, that assimilation sometimes is a, is a survival strategy, mm -hmm. um, and that over time, over across generations though, um, the politics might shift and like the, the toolkit might shift yeah. as well yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it came to be, maybe we'll shift gears and, and turn over to you, Aaron. All right. Um, that in some ways there's almost three generations represented, <laughs> you know, through Ivan. And I think like there's another elder I would cite in this project, which would be uh, Rita Cox, Dr. Rita Cox, who is the librarian who started working in the Toronto Public Library System in 1960 and by 1972 was already amassing uh, a collection that is very key to the set of collages that you brought forward here. Um, so do you want to share a little bit about yeah, how you came to work with that collection of books, um, the genesis of this collage series, and I will note for people that there's, six, there's more actually even than we had room to display in this small space. Um, but if you want to talk about yeah, what it meant to you to, to be working with that collection and to be working through e the existing representations. Um, yeah, over to you. Aaron. All right. Um, I'll start with, so the body of work was in a different show called 330. It was curated by Nick Jordan at the Doris McCarthy Gallery at U of T Scarborough. And I was just excited to be a part of that project it was a project she said, oh, you could use the library and then do whatever you want. So almost unlike Gordon, I almost had no stakes. It was kind of <laughs> good to do whatever you want to do. Uh, so unfortunately, we were trying to do that project for time and there's a whole pandemic and I had access to no resources. But once I did, I was in the gallery and let me back that up. I went to the library, an empty library, and then collected around 100 books to scan to make these collages. And I just wanted to choose books from a wide variety of content, from fiction and nonfiction, things about like sports and families, um, a little bit of mythology, a little bit of like research. So in a way, I just wanted to like highlight these books, and then I just took a chance and tried to categorize them as well. And it was really just to make collages of like six, six to 10 books each and have it all separate. But to get to this point and how I feel about it, I was really excited. This group of collages also became a vinyl that was 120 feet long on the Malvern Library where I collected the books. And I just wanted to highlight 
the books and you know kids pass by and they see images and they might not read or actually pay attention but it's supposed to be um, create like image association in their mind so when you do stumble upon the the piece of literature you're like hmm I don't know something about this is familiar <laughs> um, so in a way I just wanted to get mostly kids but because Malvern Library is a library for youth but anyone really to just stumble upon the books and have them be like re-illuminated because they already were through the Rita Cox collection. But I didn't know about it until working on the project a couple years ago. And I just think certain types of like um, archives just don't have the like constant, not re-evaluation, but like highlighting that they could have. I mean, I think it's an amazing thing that also that you it made the possibility of this encounter over time, too, that this collection was built up, that this inventory of, of images like, had been amassed over time for then you to encounter in the, through this invitation. Um, and I will say that Anique's project, too, like 3.30, was referencing the end of the school day, so it was really also focused on youth in Malvern and youth culture. Um, and there was, yeah, this amazing public facingness of the giant enlargement mm -hmm. of these same images. Um, I had a question to you about, so the series title is Seeing Knowledge, and each individual collage then also has a separate title. So I was, I was thinking about this. Did you sort them according to a visual logic, or was it the contents of the books that you know, how did, how did you make your selections? Um, it was the context of the books, but I didn't read every single book. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of books in front of It's like, imagine with this whole carpet is filled with yeah. books and you're in a gallery by yourself and you're like, how am I going to sort these? So I'm on the floor, standing up, looking around, and I'll read the back of the book, read the first page, and kind of like see the style that it's being written in. And the categories are in a way vague because many books have like knowledge about like how to protect yourself or knowledge that's like oh here's a list of ingredients for a recipe um, so it was it was open but it was mostly I would see the book I use covers that were mostly colorful that I could imagine like there's ways of like taking them apart there are many titles in the collection that were just um, a line of text, so I didn't get this far with them. Um, but yeah, it was about just reading them. It's first, like getting the books by the image on the cover, mm -hmm. but then to get the categories, um, just a little skimming through each of them and kind of seeing where um, different books align with one another. Yeah, and can you talk about how it um, relates to your? Like how you came into collage, because I know also, if I'm not mistaken, you started out using photography, taking images, like you're issuing images, originating images, yeah. I guess, and then moved into this mode of working from the given in representation and photographic reproduction. Um, yeah, can you talk about collage and your work in collage? Um, yeah, like so, like I'm trained in photography. I went to Fleming College um, in Halliburton and then I went to OCAD right after. And I guess with the landscape in Ontario and kind of expanding into Canada being very similar everywhere you go, just seeing images that I would find would be way more exciting than images that I would take. So slowly I would just like archive my own images. I have mostly things from my mom's house, beauty fashion magazines, things to like educate children, um, science, lots of animals and lots of plants as well. So I use all these things that are used to like educate me and my family to like um, rebuild them and make different like figures or spaces, characters that would be somewhat more like fantastical and like new ways of seeing like that type of image. And I brought like that way of thought into the library. And I thought maybe 
it's almost saying like maybe the book covers aren't like exciting enough and you make them a bit more exciting. <laughs> like it's for kids, like we went to tell a little side story, we went to the Malvern Library and it's mostly a library with kids just going, hang out and make jokes, um, play video games. And so it makes sense that they're going thereafter just for that social aspect. So I was just hoping like, oh, with like a static image, how do I compete with like a computer screen? Mm -hmm. And while making that, um, the vinyl that went on the library, I was just hoping, I'm like, well, this is something new, vibrant, and exciting, and maybe that alone will um, raise curiosity. So I try to make um, like fantastical characters that will like try to like stir the mind, make people think, and just imagine. Yeah. Yeah. In in your work, do you also feel like there is the stakes are also about? I don't know, like switching the valence of, of representation, you know, going against the grain. I mean, there's a category, and maybe in this collection has the advantage of actually, like, for in, in this instance, having a, a, like, a whole variety of available images of black subjects and subjectivity, but other collections or books you've worked with, maybe you're really having to, like, dig through that volume to even find representation. So if you want to talk about that and if there's meaning making and, and making new worlds too, like the kind right. of stakes of it for you there? Um, so it's always, I say it's like always difficult, even with like black literature to find like images of like black people. Almost everywhere you go, like finding images of black people is more difficult in contrast to white people or just light skin, lighter skin bodies. And so, like on that journey, sometimes it comes down to. Oh my, these as examples don't count because I'm specifically looking at book covers about like black people. But I think about in my own work, um, create shapes, um, shapes and like color that like come together to like echo some form of like blackness. It doesn't need to visually, for myself, always be someone's body and skin. There's like many like telling elements in like say even a home or a city that would just echo say oh this is a space that black people live in even within seeing like certain types of like fruits whether they be like from islands or just tropical in general they like echo some type of like um, outside of the western world mm -hmm. so I guess I just I was kind of like I just try try to it's like you make myself feel better if I feel more included in the world so there's things I would see and I'll just try to like shift them in a way that like makes sense to me mm -hmm. yeah and I think you've said it before too your relationship to books like you also grew up really in an environment there there was a lot of books around you yeah. and that was influential to you like I guess in the way now like I'm experiencing books in a way I never imagined and so it's like more exciting. It makes books like exciting again. Like it's like the excitement when you're a kid. And I don't know if you all know the Scholastic Book Club, but you get a catalog <laughs> and you get to pick out books, <laughs> maybe a toy in there. But that type of like excitement when everything is like just new and vibrant, um, I'd like to bring that to like the mm -hmm. images. Mm -hmm. So I'm very pleased that we have like the illuminated vitrines because mm -hmm. this body of work was always supposed to go with being able to like see the books and pick up the books so in that way I'm like really excited that like, people can come in and see these and then be like oh they're like connected and it's almost like unraveling a mystery when you go through every book and see the images mm -hmm. yeah do you have questions for one another <laughs> <laughs> You have one, Gordon? Yeah, I have one for you, actually. It's not necessarily about the work that's on the wall, but it's about your past. Um, currently, I, I sort of very last minute was asked to um, become an instructor uh, for the drawing and painting thesis uh, grade uh, year four. I will say grade four. Uh, thesis, uh, so I'm working with uh, students now in their fourth year thesis programs. And uh, you went to OCAD. And I wanted to know, as a black student, did you feel like 
were there any issues with feeling of belonging as a developing artist, as a developing photographer? Um, do you feel like your um, visions were being understood? Um, I'm just curious. Like, how would you how would you sum up your experience? At, at, not to you know, yeah, not I, to put you on the spot. You know? <laughs> for the record, for the record, yeah. and, and this is being recorded. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like trying to give the best like concise and straight art, but to be, you said like, to feel like included, mm -hmm. the question, I guess um, through the curriculum, it's almost bizarre to claim like, to feel included with a visual staff that's like all white staff, like for not every program, but I know in photography, like all thesis profess professors, actually all professors in photography. So then it's just difficult to ever say like, are the needs being met? Like my most fruitful time, like when in university was just having like a social group. So I'll tell younger people like, oh, like you really have to find friends that are, have the same interests and the same values because it's just difficult to go. And I think anyone who's like an immigrant or just outside of the Western world will just find that with a variety of institutions to feel like properly served when no one looks like you on right. average, yeah. Okay, thanks. And did you, the second part, did you find that hard to go on then in your own practice or what do you feel propelled you to go on in your own practice after that? Uh, I'm good with not needing direction from oh, others. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of have to be, right? Yeah. You know? <laughs> right. Well, great answer, great answer. Yeah. I love the answer. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking, Gordon, too, I mean, because you're a teacher also, um, how much do you use your, your experience as an artist when you're, you're teaching your students? Oh, so in my, so for those of you who don't know, I'm also yeah. an elementary school teacher. <laughs> I'm currently on leave with, from the Toronto District School Board um, to pursue my practice full time, and now I'm teaching at OCAD uh, one day a week. Um, so you're talking about my elementary yeah, school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I, I mean, I was thinking, reflecting on, uh, like I know Rita Cox's um, taking on the career as a storyteller w was super influential for a generation of children. Like she was really also um, um, making available representational literature to kids. And she herself had had the experience, I, as I understand it, in the New York Public Library, where when she was younger, of also having a black woman also do that kind of like story time in in she'd experience of that and then inspired her to go on and, and like be a librarian right and I'm just thinking of to this question of like how important it is to like see people in these roles as an instructor and like how much you bring in your practice as an artist into your curriculum with your elementary school students um, well first of all both my parents were teachers um, and so they were taught they were teachers in Brampton and so um, it's amazing to me now, especially now that I'm an artist and my name is out there and mm -hmm. my last name is not a common last name. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've actually met people who have been taught by my parents. <coughs> and so um, in particular, um, there's this one woman who uh, I've gotten to know who w uh, said that my mother was to her, she's a, a black woman, and she said having, for those of you who don't know Brampton, is, was very different from how it is now. <laughs> we were often the only black family in our, you know, in the school or, uh, you know, on the street. Um, it's not as, it wasn't as diverse. And so she said having a, uh, my mom was a teacher librarian and she said she'd love going to the library because she'd see this, my mom was the first elegant black lady she had seen. <laughs> my mother held her, when we talk about dignity politics, my mother was the person who held herself a certain way and dressed a certain way and encouraged us to act a certain way. And so she just, so it was amazing to hear that my parents had such an effect on young people um, and that they remembered them, you know, 30, 40 years later. Um, so I understand the capacity of what a teacher um, the, the place they can hold in someone's life. Um, with regards to my own um, teaching practice, um, I never, I, I think I was more about bringing creativity to the classroom mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, really bringing an art practice to the classroom. Mm -hmm. 
And so I approached the um, curriculum from a very um, ridiculous, <laughs> creative way. Uh, so I, I, I realized that I was also influenced by both my parents and my teaching. And my father was a storyteller. And I think my artwork tries to be tell stories. And so as a teacher, I became a storyteller. Um, it came about being really silly. It came about really creating a community. So. Um, so for me, teaching was really more of a creative outlet because I actually, um, so I wasn't actually really doing anything quote unquote creative for a number of years mm -hmm. and I started painting while I was teaching. Um, so that always impacted or influenced how I was in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, because I realized that in order to be happy when you're a creative person, you have to bring creativity to whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and so I would encourage that and try to nourish that in, in the students that I had. Um, but I also felt that it was also my responsibility to um, be a voice of reality sometimes. So um, as a black teacher, um, I've worked in both schools um, that were more diverse and some that were less diverse, leading more towards the white upper middle class, for lack of a better term. And, um, and so I often would share my experiences growing up as a black mm -hmm. child, just to have people understand what privilege looks like and what it is and how we can contrast to what other people endure. And um, I was often, um, by some of my colleagues, um, applauded for being blunt mm -hmm. and straightforward about topics they found challenging mm -hmm. uh, in the classroom. I taught seven-year-olds. and. I would like to remind them that this is the reality for many black seven-year-olds. <laughs> All I was doing was telling them a reality right. that they weren't being aware mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it wasn't a matter about being brave or it was a matter of just saying, well, this is my reality and this is the reality of other people and there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to share these things with children when children are experiencing these things. Um, so I like to find this really balance, this, this, I like to find a balance of of being creative, but also at the same time bringing my blackness with me where I go in the sense of, of connecting with students or um, uh, educating students about what life is like. Thank you. Um, so I think at this juncture, because I, I have the distinct pleasure of being able to converse with you, <laughs> you guys over the process about your work, um, if there are questions from the audience, now is your opportunity um, to ask of Aaron or Gordon um, about the project. There's a question over right here. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Noah Khan. I'm a poetry. Yes. Hi, I'm Noah Khan. I'm a poetry. Um, hi, uh, I'm Noah Khan. I'm a Massey uh, Junior Fellow here. And my question is to either uh, Gordon or Aaron. And I was wondering if you could speak to the affective dimension of your art creation. So thinking through the emotions and the feelings that you were experiencing through your process and maybe how they affected uh, the products that you created? Um, I guess I'll start. I First thing comes to mind, I've just been looking at this one when I see <laughs> Gordon and that was probably the last piece I made of the whole series and there's just, it's not that I want things to feel like like chaos but it's imagine you had in a messy room and like you could find one of these like in that like mess of paper, so it's almost like a, an organized, unorganized creation. So there's always a little feeling of like um, trying to bring together, like being scattered. Yeah. Okay. Um, for me, you want to know the emotions that I was feeling when I was creating the work? Is that the right? So yeah, the emotions that you were feeling and maybe how they influenced uh, the the outcome. Panic. <laughs> uh, uh, panic pushes me a lot. <laughs> um, it, it really was, for me, I, I really kept thinking about my dad. Like I really kept thinking about um, the love that I have for my father and uh, this is a person who was really loved by a lot of people and was very important to a lot of people. Um, and so I think um, that kind of that was what I was really feeling. And, but at the same time, also trying to um, emotionally separate myself a bit because it wasn't my father that I was painting. So I had to sort of keep um, 
sort of two halves of my brains going because I had to keep thinking about um, representing him properly, right? So, um, but at the same time, I always like when my paintings um, evoke responses from people. So I, I try to create, um, I try to imbue the paintings, I try to imbue the work with some sort of emotion. So I really am hoping that people will see warmth when they see the painting. Um, and that's, I guess, essentially what I was feeling. Uh, and panic. <laughs> <laughs> My question is for you, Eric Malvern. In GTA, the history of Toronto, Scarborough has been the negative place to live. Yet today, Scarborough is the hotbed of culture in terms of music, art, creativity. You know, Scarborough is where it's at versus Etobicoke and all the other places that. Uh, I uh, just wonder what your experience is around that today. And then I'd also ask you, Gordon, the difference between the Scarborough that you grew up with the image of and the Scarborough of today, that I'm not sure how many people really understand how vibrant Scarborough mm -hmm. actually is mm -hmm. in this time. Mm -hmm. there's, there's so much the stuff in Scarborough. I was like, I don't <laughs> know where to start. But I, I guess the like, easier way for me to think about it is like a lot of people just want to like enjoy their lives, mm -hmm. and so transit sucks and no one really likes taking the bus, but just make it fun. And so I know lots of kids who just like, oh, let's make music now because we're bored. And there's a lot of things that happen when you can say like a a city doesn't really do things for the community that are like negative but at the same time it's like people just want to enjoy their lives so I've seen a lot of that and to the point even during the pandemic I've seen a lot of younger kids or young adults like late teens early 20s just spend actually all their time together like they never had before like people finished high school and they said oh what are we gonna do and they find space like this big for themselves to see and make music, skateboard, um, just hang out. But I think in the numbers in Scarborough, it's just that's like the big part of like not having resources. So you almost just manifest something to enjoy your life and just enjoy your space. Um, for me, I think it's about stigma. I think Scarborough especially growing up in the suburbs where I grew up, there was a stigma with Scarborough, and that doesn't exist anymore. Not to the extent the way it did when I was younger. And um, I, I agree with Aaron. I think it's about people just in trying to embrace joy. I think um, with the stigma that people might have had about Scarborough, they're also projecting something that, that did get manifested because of people's attitudes towards it. And uh, yeah, it, it needs to be better served. But I think people are really embracing joy. I think, I think there's a greater understanding. I think social media, in some ways, is really helping as well. It's bringing people together, and it's making people recognize that there are ways to be creative. There are ways to express yourself. I think the city, in some ways, is trying to do some more programming with regards to, I can't speak specifically, uh, but I know that there are efforts in trying to engage younger people in different programs. Um, but I think it has changed definitely. I think it's been an interesting 50 years of evolution to, <laughs> to see, to live in Southern Ontario, to see how all the changes have happened. Um, but I'm not really immersed, so I don't really know that I can speak to it fully. It's the next yeah. chapter. Scarborough is the next chapter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is there another question? Yeah, go ahead. Has such a strong voice, but I I want to make three statements. First of all, you have excellent taste, A A R O N. Okay. Thank you. Secondly, it is the most unique art that I have seen in my life so far. Oh, wow. And I was born in Athens, Greece. I ought to have seen 
Something else that <laughs> you <laughs> Okay? Thank you. And thirdly, I know you're not obsessive compulsive. Okay? That is sickness. But you are compulsive. No one can draw so cleanly on a white background. It's amazing. I am very impressed and I wish you the best of luck. If I had money, I would buy every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a good reminder to me <laughs> that these works, I'm with this, during the process actually, we started yeah. talking about exhibiting them. They are now part of the permanent collection of the Doris McCarthy Gallery on the Scarborough campus at U of T. Um, so effectively by entering into that institution, it's also they are a, a public good in that way, like they are, have this permanent care framework. So I want to also thank <coughs> my colleagues out there um, who will be the long-term custodians of yeah. this work and help it circulate further in the world. Just one more thing. Is that cricket? Yeah. <laughs> my late husband was a blue from Cambridge University in cricket. I would love to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, the show will be up for the full year, so yeah. you can come back into the room and commune with the collages. <laughs> Are there any last questions? Yeah. Oh, John's got a question. <laughs> um, I, I'm always interested in what artists are working on next and, and kind of how you keep it pumped up, basically. Uh, you know, what's, what's the, how do you keep the inspo going? Um, what do you do? What do you listen to? Where do you go? Do you have groups that you feel good with? What's next on the agenda? Uh, you can take this. I can take it. Um, <laughs> well, I have, I'm making a video projection for Nuit Blanche coming up for October 1st. And it's the last iteration of this work, actually. And that'll be projected at the Civic Center in Scarborough. Um, and to keep it pumped up, I guess I like physical activity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you fully remove your mind from anything creative, and then you, yeah. it's like changing where you're thinking and bringing it in different places. Yeah. Um, so I currently have an exhibition on at uh, Spadina Museum. Uh, which was a huge undertaking. <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, and that's going to be on until the end of February. So I, for those of you who don't know, I was actually asked by the city to um, have an intervention there, essentially, and, and, um, and uh, decolonize the space. And so I co-curated um, uh, an exhibit there with Umbrina Nayat and uh, Awakenings, and so I think you're coming to my artist talk. I am, I booked my ticket. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, that was a very um, challenging show to put together. It was very rewarding. It was, uh, and so that's, I was doing a lot of programming with that still, so um, I'm doing a lot of tours with that, but I'm also uh, with a gallery called United Contemporary. They represent me. I'm doing um, uh, Art Toronto. I have pieces for that. I have a show that they've arranged with the Aguilera Center in the Bahamas, so I'm going to be going out to the Bahamas. And then I have a solo show coming up in May, as well as my new teaching practice. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there you go. So the, the answer there is, is panic motivates me. Uh, <laughs> uh, the fact that I just did a renovation motivates me. <laughs> um, I have an incredible partner that motivates me. Uh, my partner James is here and he does uh, a lot to assist me he, with the, the last exhibit. Uh, he really, really helped and also does some of my research for me. Um, but with regards to things like music or, um, I'm oddly um, interested in having TV shows on in the background while I'm painting. So. Um, I think I need to sort of get pulled out every couple of, you know, in a bit, because I think, you know, you get so focused and fixated, and it's, it's better to, for me, to just sort of have something 
yeah, I use the word ridiculous a lot, but it is often ridiculous stuff that I have on. Um, often it was cartoons. I just haven't found any good cartoons lately. Yeah. So um, I do listen to some music occasionally for breaks, but um, I have just recently started exercising. This young man is very smart because <laughs> <laughs> now I have years of things to undo to my body because I never exercise. So keep it up because <laughs> I'm going through a lot right now. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I think uh, uh, panic is essentially the answer as well. So. But I, I, I have to say, I I'm, I'm never thought, I, again, I am incredibly grateful and know I'm incredibly privileged to be in this position right now. And um, I, I, my goal is for uh, more black artists to be supported in the art community so that they can have full time uh, practices and not have two side gigs to continue going. Um, it was a number of years of still teaching and painting at the same time that allowed me to do the work that I wanted to do. And now I'm at a position where I can paint full time. And that's not a typical situation for many black artists. It's often dependent on grants as well. I just wanted to get that out there. <laughs> so support black art. <laughs> um. I think with that, I, I want to really sincerely thank um, the both of you for um, coming on board with this project and um, bringing it to this point and um, taking that invitation and saying yes. Um, and I do think that it, it will have like a material, it affects a material change in this room that um, I think will continue to register. Um, and to the Massey community who use this room, these books are for reading. Um, so please use them as a resource. Um, come back, spend time with these works. And um, it's been incredible to work with you both. And I also want to signal that it was a real collaborative project. We got a lot of support from the college, um, Massey Foundation, and also Behind the scenes, we had our installer, Dax Morrison, who worked to put the work on the walls. Um, and also, the volume that you are holding, hopefully, in your hands, if not, take copies multiple, um, is thanks to the handiwork of Lisa Kiss, who's here with us today, designed it, um, which is a nice record of the project over time. So um, thank you all for your presence. And I'll say there's a small reception set up for us just next door so we can keep talking under less bright lights <laughs> um, and, and continue that conversation. So again, thank you to both of you and thanks to everyone for coming. Woo!